Erev Tov Rabotai, we are continuing with our Mishnah Yomim, Masechet Yevamot, we are up to Perek Tezayin, Mishnah Zayin. Today's Mishnah should be Leilu Nishmad, Neria Ben Svetlana, Ranbaya Eliyahu Ben, Burcha Yisraelo, Ben Chanabad Miriam, Menuchatam Began Eden, Amen, Elavdi Ben Chaim Nechaim, Ben Refua Shilemav, Daniel Shalom Ben Roza, Betoch Shach Ule Yisrael. We have learned that a single witness, even someone who is usually not accepted as a witness, such as a woman, is believed to say that a man is dead in order to allow his wife to remarry. The Mishnah explains how this law became the accepted practice. Amar Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said, When I went down from Eretz Yisrael to Narda, a city, a city in Babylonia, to establish the leap year in earlier times, Leap years in the Jewish calendar, which contained 13 months instead of 12, were established by a rabbinic court convened for that purpose. Usually this court met in Eretz Yisrael. In this instance, the Romans who ruled Eretz Yisrael had forbidden the Jews from establishing a leap year. Therefore, it was done in Babylonia. So Rabbi Akiva said, when I went down from Eretz Yisrael to Naharda to establish the leap year, Matzati Nechemi Ish Bet Deli, I met Nehemiah of Beit Deli. Amarli, he said to me, Shemati shen masinet aisha b'Eretz Yisrael al pi edichad. I have heard that none of the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael allow women to remarry on the testimony of a single witness that her husband died. Ela Rabbi Yudah ben Bava, except for Rabbi Yudah ben Bava, who is the only one who relies on such testimony. Venumeti lo ken advarim. I said to Nehemiah, that statement is correct. Amarli, amolem mishmi. He said to me, tell the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael in my name. You know that the roads in this country are in turmoil because of threatening troops, and therefore I cannot go to Eretz Israel myself. However, I wish to pass on the tradition I received from Rabban Gamliel, the elder, that we permit a woman to remarry based on the testimony of a single witness. Rabbi Akiva continued, and when I came back to Eretz Yisrael and presented Nehemiah's words before Rabban Gamliel, who was Rabban Gamliel, the elder's grandson, he rejoiced in my words, and said, we have now found a companion who agrees with Rabbi Yudah ben Bava, namely Rabban Gamliel, the elder, and we can now allow women to remarry more easily. While discussing this matter, Rabban Gamliel remembered an incident that once men had been killed in Tel Arza. Rabban Gamliel, the elder, had allowed their wives to remarry based on the word of a single witness, just as Nehemiah had related. As a result of receiving this tradition, it became established for all the rabbis to allow women to remarry based on a single witness. In addition, it later became established to allow women to remarry based on a witness relating testimony that he had heard from another witness. Although such testimony is usually not accepted in court, it is accepted to allow women to remarry as we have learned in Mishnah 5. And based on testimony given by a Canaanite slave, a woman, or a Canaanite maidservant. Although these are usually not valid witnesses, as it says in Rosh Hashanah, chapter 1, Mishnah 8, they are believed in order to allow a woman to remarry. The Mishnah cites other opinions. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua, Omrim, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua say, We do not allow women to remarry based on a single witness. This opinion was actually said before the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael became aware of the tradition passed on by Nehemiah that the Mishnah mentioned earlier. Once that tradition was accepted and all the rabbis began allowing women to marry based on a single witness, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua did so as well. As the Rav tells us, does not follow Rabbi Yezer, Rabbi Yeshua, rather what's the law, we allow a woman to remarry based on testimony given by a woman, and also based on the witness, uh, testimony of family witnesses, except for the five women that we listed earlier in the Mishnah, and and again, based on a testimony given by a Canaanite slave, a uh, Canaanite maidservant, or a woman, are kosher for the testimony to allow a woman to remarry. Rabbi Akiva says, 
a wife may not remarry based on the testimony of a woman, nor based on a Canaanite slave, nor based on a Canaanite maidservant, nor based on the wife's relatives. Since these people are not fit to serve as witnesses, they may not serve as witnesses even to allow a woman to remarry. This statement of Rabbi Akiva and the discussion that follows took place before it had become generally accepted to allow these people to testify. At that time, the sages allowed these forms of testimony, but Rabbi Akiva did not. However, as the Mishnah stated earlier, all the rabbis, including Rabbi Akiva, eventually began to accept the testimony of women and slaves in order to allow wives to remarry. The same applies with regard to the wives' relatives, as the Gemara says on page 122a. And like we just said, this is the opinion of the Rav as well. Allah does not follow Rabbi Reza, Rabbi Shun, Rabbi Akiva's prior opinion. It follows the opinion that is established by the sages after Nehemiah's testimony. The sages who held that a woman may remarry based on such testimony challenged Rabbi Akiva's ruling based on an incident. Amrullah, the sages told Rabbi Akiva, how can you say that a wife may not remarry based on a woman's testimony? There was an incident with Levim who traveled to Tzor, the city of date palms. And one of them became sick along the way. They viewed Bapundak and they brought him to an inn. They continued to Tzor without him. And on their return, they said to the women innkeeper, where is our friend? She told him he died and I buried him. They see what Yishto, based on her words, the rabbis allowed that man's wife to remarry. Although the innkeeper was an idolater who was suspected of lying deliberately as we learned in Mishnah 5, the Gemara on page 122b in Masech Devot explains that the innkeeper began to cry as soon as she saw the Levi'im. Only then did they ask about their friend to which she responded that he had died. Since she had begun to cry before they asked her anything and did not simply relate to the, ma the man's death in response to their question, it is as though she mentioned his death without intending to testify, in which case she is believed. As we spoke about earlier in Mishnah 5. Amrulu, the sages said, Rabbi Akiva, Vlotiye Chohenet Kapundakit, Shari Kohenet, or other Jewish women of distinguished lineage, not be considered as reliable as this idolatrous female innkeeper. If this innkeeper was believed to allow a man's wife to remarry, should we not certainly accept the testimony of a Jewish woman in order to allow a woman to remarry? Although an idolater suspected of lying deliberately, this innkeeper was believed because she had not intended to testify. If so, a Jewish woman who is not suspected of lying, but is simply not vowed to serve as a witness, should surely be believed. Rabbi Akiva responds, Amar lem, Rabbi Akiva told them, Lechshetie pundakit neemenet, when the innkeeper will be believed, Jewish women will also be believed. In other words, had the innkeeper been believed, you would have a valid argument. However, the innkeeper was in fact not believed on her word alone. Hapundakit otzia lem maklo v'tarmilo v'seva Torah she'a be'ado. Rather, the innkeeper brought out to them a dead man's staff and pouch and a Torah scroll that had been in his possession. These items served as proof that their friend had truly died and confirmed her words. For if he were still alive, he would not have left that without these items. Now, although finding a person's possession is not proof that he is dead, it is enough to corroborate the innkeeper's claim that he had died. However, her word or that of any woman cannot be believed on its own. As Rabbi Akiva said, again, L'Rachafa is the opinion of the sages. That is in Rabotai of chapter 16, Mishnah 7. And that is likewise the end of Mesechet Yavamot. Salik Mesechet Yavamot. Hadrachalan. Vadran Alach. Mesechet Yavamot. We continue now, Bezat Hashem Brineder, with Mesechet Ketubot. Mesechet Ketubot deals with the obligations that a husband and wife have toward each other. Its name comes from the word Ketuba, which has two meanings. A, the marriage contract that a groom hands over to his bride when they get married, in which his commitments towards her are recorded. And B, the payment that a husband or his estate must make to his wife if their marriage ends in divorce or his death. After the husband dies, his heirs must pay her with property that they inherited from him. We begin now with chapter 1, Mishnah 1. The sages decreed that a marriage nisuin may take place on only certain days of the week. In Jewish law, two acts are needed for a marriage to fully take effect. Erusin or Kiddushin and Nisuin. The first act Erusin makes the bride and groom legally married in most respects. For example, intimacy between the bride and another man is adultery. The bride must be formally divorced before she may marry anyone else. However, they are forbidden to live together as husband and wife until Nisuin. In olden times, the two acts were performed a long time apart, often a year or more, as the Mishnah mentions in chapter 5, Mishnah 1. Nowadays, they're usually performed one after the other in a single ceremony. 
The words Ehusin and Nisuin describe not only the acts themselves, but also the periods of marriage that they initiate. Therefore, the period after Ehusin is also called Ehusin, and the period that follows Nisuin is also called Nisuin. Now we begin with the Mishnah, Betula Nisel Yom Revi, a virgin may be married only on a Wednesday, Van Manali Yom Hamishi, and a widow, a non virgin, may be married only on a Thursday. Now, although the Mishnah says widow, the same law applies to any woman who is, not, who is known not to be a virgin, such as a divorcee, she too may be married only on a Thursday. On the other hand, the Mishnah's law is limited to a widow or divorcee whose, husband, whose marriage ended during the period of Nisuin. If it ended during Erusin, before she lived with her husband, she is presumably still a virgin, so her second marriage must take place on a Wednesday. Now, a virgin may be married only on a Wednesday, because the courts are in session in large towns twice a week, on Monday and Thursday, Therefore, if the groom has a claim against his bride's virginity, for example, he did not find blood, which raises the possibility she is not a virgin and might therefore be prohibited to him, he will go to court early the next morning, Thursday. If on their wedding night a groom sees that his wife is not a virgin, he can go to court to claim that she does not have that he does not have to pay her ktuba. The sages wanted to make sure that the husband goes to court for the reason that we're going to say. They decreed, therefore, that Nisuin must be performed on a Wednesday, the day before the courts are in session. So if a groom has a claim against his bride, he can rush to court the morning after the wedding night before his anger has a chance to cool. If Nisuin would take place on some other day, he might not go to court at all because his anger might subside by the time the court opens. Now the reason why it is so important for the groom to go to court is as follows. When a bride is found not to be a virgin at the time of Nisuin, there are grounds to suspect that she slept with another man during Erosin, which would be adultery. If adultery had indeed taken place, the married couple may not continue living together because the wife who commit, committed adultery is biblically prohibited to her husband. To protect them from the sin, the sages wanted the groom to go to court so that his claim will become known to the public and upon hearing about it, reliable witnesses may come forward to testify whether adultery had occurred. If he does not go to court, witnesses are less likely to testify and the couple might remain in what could be a forbidden relationship. One may not marry a virgin on a Sunday, however, even though the courts are open the next morning because getting married on a Sunday does not leave enough time after Shabbat to prepare a fitting meal for a wedding. The sages made great efforts for the benefit of Jewish women, even to the extent of obligating a groom to spend at least three days preparing for the wedding feast. In times when the courts do not sit specifically on Monday and Thursday, such as nowadays, the Rav says one may perform Nisuin on any weekday, provided that one spends at least three days preparing for the wedding feast. A widow, a non-virgin, may be married only on a Thursday, so that the groom will stay home and rejoice with her for three days, Thursday, Friday, and Shabbat. One who marries a widow or divorcee must refrain from work for at least three days, and spend the time rejoicing with his new wife. This is another law that was passed by the rabbis for the benefit of Jewish women. And to make it more likely this law will be observed, the rabbis decreed that a widow be married on a Thursday because the groom will certainly rejoice with her on the day of their wedding and the next day Friday due to the affection inspired by the consummation of the marriage and Shabbat when he is home in any case, as Rashi explains on page 5a, Mesech Kitubot. Now this applies only to a widow and not a virgin because one who marries a virgin must rejoice with her for seven days. And that is the number of today's Mishnah Yomi. Again, Mazal Tov on the completion of Mesechid Yavamot. Bizrat Hashem Blineda, we will continue with Mesechid Kitubot. Bauch Adonai Leolam. Amen v'amen.